Hi, this is the review for test one, and I hope it's helpful, and we should start. Okay, first, let's talk a little bit about the parts of speech, which was really where we started. You can't get very far in grammar without at least having this uh, shared vocabulary for the parts of speech. So we talked about, let me get my pen working here. Is my pen working? Okay, nouns. And remember that we said about nouns, the person, place, or thing, uh, which is what pretty much everybody remembers, you know, from third grade, person, place, or thing. But remember that we also said idea. And, and the idea one, the idea noun, also sometimes called an abstraction, is the one that's sometimes a little bit difficult to recognize as a noun because you don't think of it as, as like an obvious thing, you know, that you can pick up. So again, we, t we said, you know, examples of of the idea noun, of the abstract noun, would be things like courage, happiness, love, justice, those kinds of concepts that you can't necessarily, uh, you know, hold in your hand. Well, you can do that in a poem, but I mean, you know, not in conventional, unimaginative life. Okay, so about pronouns, we said that a pronoun is a word that replaces a specific noun. And pronouns, the study of pronouns gets very complicated in, in grammar, and, and we don't really go into any complicated territory with pronouns. But for our purposes, you're fine if you remember that a pronoun is, you know, a, a like, like a, a word like she, for example, instead of a specific woman's name. So instead of Allison, we would say she. So the personal pronouns like that, the indefinite pronouns like everyone, everybody, though that's all we really need to know about pronouns. Verbs, very important part of a sentence. We can't do anything without a verb. Uh, remember also that verbs kind of fall into two categories. The action verbs, and that's, again, probably the easiest to recognize, but also what I think we all remember from, from uh, third grade, too, if we had grammar way back then. You know, th the kinds of verbs where you can clearly visualize someone doing that, like running or jumping or smashing. But remember that there are also the verbs of existence, which you can't necessarily see someone doing. The most common verb of existence is, of course, be and all of its forms. So remember that those are indeed verbs, even though they're not very obvious actions necessarily, but they're the verbs of existence. So be, seem, become. Later on, we saw that, that those were linking verbs very often. So, okay. Prepositions we started talking about early on too, mainly because we were putting brackets around the prepositional phrases to kind of eliminate them when we were looking for the subject and the verb. That was a helpful little trick. So remember about prepositions that a preposition must exist inside a phrase. Uh, it's not a preposition if it doesn't have a phrase. And inside that phrase, we have to have a noun that is functioning as the object of a preposition. Well, we usually abbreviate that as OP. Okay, so you have to have a phrase with the preposition at the beginning and somewhere in there another noun that is functioning as the object of that preposition. And remember that we said that a noun that's functioning as some kind of an object can never be a subject in that same sentence at the same time. So that's again one of the reasons why it's helpful to put brackets around the prepositional phrases. All right, adjectives and adverbs are two modifiers. Adjectives modify nouns or pronouns. Ma adjectives are usually easy to recognize too because they modify the noun that they modify pretty obviously. Adverbs are the ones that are sometimes tricky and it's best to think of adverbs in terms of those six kind of adverbial concepts. Is it six on the top of page? something. I don't have my book right in front of me. I should. Okay, but, but the categories of things like manner, degree, direction, place, those are adverbial ideas. 
and it's going to be easier to recognize an adverb if you think in terms of those adverbial ideas than if you think in terms of what word is it modifying. Because that's not always going to be very obvious with an adverb. It's not as obvious as it is with an adjective. Okay, there are also a couple other parts of speech that your book didn't really introduce in these chapters. One is a conjunction, which are words that join, like and or but. And uh, the other part of speech that your book doesn't talk about is the interjection. I don't think your book talks about it. But interjections are things like, um, they're not really part of the sentence necessarily, but they're things like, hey, leave me alone. Or, wow, that's... uh, fascinating verb you have in that sentence. Words like wow or hey or or something that you kind of interject into the sentence. All right, enough of the parts of speech. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Are we on the next slide? There we are. Verbs. Some of the things we were saying about verbs at this point, the principal parts. No, wait, you know, I should... Uh, I should get another color because I'm tired of uh, purple now. Green? What do you think? Green. Green's good. Oh, wait, I have to switch it to green. It doesn't go so easily. There. Okay, I should be on green now. Am I on green now? Oh, yeah. There we go. Okay, so the principal parts, remember that one because that's going to come up again and again as we talk about verbs. Principal parts that we've talked about so far, the infinitive the past tense, the past participle. Later on, we're going to talk about the present participle, but for for right now, we're we're good with that. Okay, we also said that verbs are either regular or irregular. And you remember that we defined an irregular verb as a verb that does not form its past tense and or past participle by adding ed. A regular verb adds ed to the infinitive to form the past tense or the past participle. An irregular verb does something else. Okay, and we said that verbs inflect, which really just means change somehow, they inflect to show person, number, tense, voice, and mood. We have not yet talked about voice or mood, but we've talked about person as in first, second, third. We've talked about number, as in singular or plural, and we've talked about tense in the, in the first six tenses that we learned. Remember that a verb has to have a subject. A subject has to be a noun. It's not a verb if it doesn't have a subject. Okay, it can't be a verb if it doesn't have a noun that's functioning as its subject. And the other way around, too, a noun cannot be a subject unless it has a verb. So. Before you call something a verb, make sure you can find a noun that's functioning as its subject. And verbs can be classified as transitive or intransitive or linking. A linking verb is a kind of intransitive verb. That was supposed to look like an arrow, but that didn't work very well. Okay, let's try that again. There, ah, there we go. Okay, a linking verb is a kind of intransitive verb, but not all intransitive verbs are linking. Remember that we defined transitive verb as a verb that takes a direct object. That's really all we need to say about it at this point, that it's a verb that has a direct object, a noun that's functioning as its direct object. And auxiliary verbs, which are also sometimes called helping verbs, and they're the the little sort of additional verb things we need to form the different tenses, the different voices. For example, to form the future tense, we saw that we need the auxiliary will. To form the perfect tenses, we need some form of the auxiliary have. All right? Okay. Have, of course, is um, is interesting because it's it's very often an auxiliary verb, but it can also be a main verb. It can also be its own verb, as in, I have a frappuccino right now, which I need. I'm going to have a sip from. Okay, hang on one second. All right, it's very early and I'm not totally awake, so bear with me. All right. Okay, let's kind of let's kind of practice some of these tenses we studied. Okay.
Take a look, take a look at these and, and see if you can say what tense they are. Have come. What do you think? That's present perfect. Have come. Present perfect. Okay. One of the ways you can tell it's present perfect is that if you look at the auxiliary have, you can see that that, that is conjugated into the present. Past perfect would be had come, had come, but this is present perfect because of have. Okay, what about came, came, she came to the party yesterday. That's the past, just the straight past. Saw, past, okay. Will have seen, will have seen. Future, perfect, right? Future, we have our auxiliary will. Perfect, we have our auxiliary have. So the entire verb is will have seen. If you were underlining that on a sentence, will have seen the whole thing. Okay, see, just see, that's present. Had eaten had eaten past perfect eight past had been past perfect and is is present sure it's the present tense, third person, singular of our most irregular verb to be, right? So go back and look at the top of the list. Have come. Same verb there. What's, what's the infinitive of have come or came? It's to come, right? That's a, that's a strange irregular verb because the past participle is the same as the, as the infinitive, right? It's come, came, come, have come. Uh, saw, will have seen, see, what's the infinitive of, of that verb? To see, see. Had eaten, ate, what's the infinitive of that verb? Eat, right? And what about had been and is, what's the infinitive of that? Be, sure, to be, okay. And if you're talking about an infinitive, it doesn't matter if you say it's be or to be, just kind of be consistent in how you say that, but there's no rule that you have to include the two if you're talking about the infinitive. Sometimes it's just more, more helpful to think of it that way. All right, let's, let's go over some of the sentence patterns that your book talked about because it really is sort of a helpful shorthand to have when we're talking about different, different well, just different patterns of what can happen in a clause. Okay, the first one, sentence pattern one, was, oh, I need to change my, uh, hang on, changing my um, pen but it's not working. Uh, okay, should be like pink, magenta, there we go, good. All right, a sentence pattern one was a subject and an intransitive verb and no other compliments coming after it. That was it, a subject and an intransitive verb. Okay, here's an example of a sentence pattern one sentence. Okay, the shark swam around the small rowboat. Okay, so first, when you just look at that, what do you want to do to it to get a sense of what's going on here? Remember to bracket off the prepositional phrases because that's always going to be very helpful, okay? So around the small rowboat is, is a prepositional phrase. Here's Here's our preposition right here around. The noun that's functioning as the object of that preposition is rowboat. And small is an adjective modifying rowboat, right? And actually, the is going to be considered an adjective too, modifying rowboat, because your book considers articles like the adjectives. Okay, so we're left with the shark swam. Only one of those things sound like a verb, I think. I think, swam, right? Because you can't shark something. 
Okay, so the shark swam, and, and what is the noun that was doing this swimming? It's the shark. Okay, so we have our subject, we have our intransitive verb. And again, even though there's stuff that comes after the verb, this is an intransitive verb because it doesn't have a direct object. And it's also not a linking verb because it's not followed by a subjective complement. When a verb is just followed by a prepositional phrase like this whole thing over here, or when a verb is followed by an adverb, like we, if we just said the shark swam quickly, can you read that? That's supposed to look like quickly. The shark swam quickly. This would still be a pattern one sentence because quickly is an adverb and it, it, it's not a complement. All right, that's a sentence pattern one. Okay, let's look at a sentence pattern two. I'm sorry my writing is so, it's, you know, it's hard to explain the different kinds of hardware I have set up here on this too small writing area to make this whole thing happen. So I'm doing my best. Okay. <laughs> All right, sentence pattern two. A subject, an intransitive verb, but a special kind of intransitive verb that we're going to call a linking verb, plus a subjective complement, right? And the subjective complement can be an adjective or a noun, not an adverb, remember, an adjective or a noun. So subject, linking verb, and an adjective or noun subjective complement. So here are a couple of examples of a sentence pattern two, of sentence pattern two sentences. All right, the iPad is one of Apple's most popular products. Well, of Apple's most popular product, prepositional phrase. So that's not really going to help us in looking at the sentence pattern. So we're still going to put brackets around that. So we have the iPad is one. Here's our verb, in this case to be, which is very often a linking verb. Its subject is, of course, the iPad. And you look at one, which is uh, often considered a pronoun. Uh, sometimes it's just considered a noun, same function. But that's functioning as our noun subjective complement here, right? In the second sentence, the iPad looks very cool. Well, we, we don't have any prepositional stuff there, but here's our verb, right? Looks, subject once again is iPad. And what's going on with looks? Well, you remember from your chapter that talked about the linking verbs that looks is very often a linking verb. Not absolutely always, but very often. I have to do some computer thing here. Hang on one second, sorry. All right, very often a linking verb. Is it a linking verb in this case? Well, yes, it is because it has a subjective complement. Over here, cool, right? Adjective or noun subjective complement? This one's an adjective. Okay, so these are both examples of sentence pattern two. The top one here has a noun subjective complement. This one over here has an adjective subjective complement. All right, let's look at sentence pattern three. Pattern three, very common pattern in English. Subject, transitive verb this time, and a direct object. And again, we define a transitive verb as a verb that takes a direct object. That, by definition, is what a transitive verb is. Direct object always has to be a noun, always. It's not, it's not a direct object otherwise if it's not a noun. And it's a noun that's, that's not doing the action, but that is kind of receiving the action. It's having something done to it by the subject through the verb. Okay, so the subject is doing something to the direct object with the verb. So if you look at, at our sample sentence here, she ordered an absinthe cocktail with her cheeseburger. Once again, uh, with her cheeseburger, prepositional. So it's a fascinating detail, but not necessarily what's going to help us with the sentence pattern here. So she ordered an absinthe cocktail. What looks like a verb? Okay, here it is. Ordered. She is the subject of ordered. What's the noun that she ordered. So in other words, what's the direct object? Well, it's, it's cocktail. That's the thing she ordered, right? It's the thing she ordered. 
No, that was, no, it's supposed to, uh, it's supposed to go like this. There. Does that work? <laughs> All right. Let's look at sentence pattern four. A subject, a transitive verb again, but this time another element that we're going to call an indirect object. And our, in our book, uh, sentence pattern four is the only one that has an indirect object. So subject, transitive verb, indirect object, and direct object. Okay? Here's an example. He showed me his new Lamy pen. Lamy makes beautiful pens. Okay, he showed me his new Lamy pen. We actually don't have any prepositional stuff here, do we? No. All right, what's our verb? Showed. And transitive verbs usually, usually do have a, a, a more obvious action that you can kind of see someone doing. Subject of showed is the pronoun he. He showed me his new Lamy pen. Well, we have, you remember that both, both indirect objects and direct objects, actually every kind of object has to be a noun, okay? Objects are the preposition too, right? All, all objects have to be nouns. We actually have two more things in this sentence that are functioning as nouns. Over here, the pronoun uh, me, of course, and pen, both of them nouns, right? Function as nouns. Me is a pronoun, but it still functions the same as a noun. So, you know, if you ask yourself, what is it that he actually showed? He showed the pen. He didn't show me. By that, I mean he didn't, like, pick me up and display me to his friends. You know, like, here, look at, look at this Barbara I found. No, he did that with the pen. So the pen is the direct object, the thing that he actually showed. He showed it to me. So me is the indirect object. And remember we said that pattern four sentences can always be rephrased as a pattern three sentence with the indirect object inside a prepositional phrase? That would give us, if we did that, we'd get he showed. I'll stop for a second let you think about what it should be. His new Lamy pen. Do I have to write that whole thing out? Yeah, I guess I do. His new Lamy pen to me. To me is now inside a prepositional phrase, and we actually just have a pattern three sentence with a subject, a transitive verb, and a direct object over here. Okay? Now I have to change my, uh, my pen again because I'm, I'm getting bored with... Uh... Okay, it should be... All right, sentence pattern five. We have a subject, a transitive verb, once again, a direct object, and this time, another element we're going to call an objective complement. Not a subjective complement, but an objective complement. An objective complement completes the idea of the direct object much the same way a subjective complement completes the idea of the subject. And just as a subjective complement has to be either an adjective or a noun, we see the same thing happening here with an objective complement. It has to be either an adjective or a noun. All right. So we have two examples because I wanted to give you one that was an adjective objective complement and another one that was a noun objective complement. Our first one, the salty margarita made me thirsty. The salty margarita made me thirsty. And the second one, Mary called her husband an idiot. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry Mary's husband, but it's true. Well, no, not that he's an idiot, but that she called him that. That's all I'm saying. All right, we don't have any prepositional stuff here, but uh, let's look at the first sentence and what do you see as the verb, kind of obviously, uh, made, right? Past tense of to make. And what's the noun that's functioning as the subject of that? It's margarita. And what in this case is the direct object? The margarita made something or somebody do something. Um, it's me, right? I am the direct object of the verb, the transitive verb made in this sentence. And if you look at thirsty, you see that that's an adjective modifying me. 
And do you see that the relationship between the direct object me and the adjective thirsty, that relationship there is explained really through the verb made. That's explaining what, what the word me and thirsty have to do with each other. Yeah, does that make sense? So thirsty, is that a noun or an adjective? Pretty obviously that's an adjective, I think, right? What about the second one here? Mary called her husband an idiot. Mary called. Husband is the direct object. And the thing she called him in this case is an idiot. So that is our objective complement in this case. It is a noun objective complement because it's like a thing or person or entity, right? Okay. All right. Well, we, we talked about the five sentence patterns a little bit, parts of speech, verb tenses. I hope this was helpful, and I'll uh, see you next time. We are finished. Yes, we are.